Welcome to another episode of uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, uh, which is produced by Politics in Motion. Now, last week I went over the case of Owen Latimore and McCarthyism, and I want uh, to uh, bring that question up to date in terms of what is happening in the here and now. Uh, but before doing so, I want to just uh, engage in one of those rare rare events, which is that I actually tell a joke, uh, well, or at least a, a funny funny line. And the funny line was that which uh, came from a very unfunny person, which was uh, Gromyko, uh, who, who was a prime minister, a foreign minister, in the Soviet Union. Uh, at a period when uh, the Cold War, when the United States uh, limited the capacity of Soviet uh, potential to leave New York State when they visited the country uh, for the meetings of the United Nations. And in protest at that, Gromyko had stayed away from the United States uh, for some time. Eventually, the United States relaxed its policies and allowed people to go further than, I don't know, north of 125th Street or something of that kind. Finally relaxed its policies and Gromyko came back to be at one of the UN sessions. And in doing so, the New York Times published a, a sort of full page uh, history of who Gromyko was, what he'd done, all the, what he involved in and so on. And uh, somebody asked uh, Gromyko and said, uh, have you read the piece? And he said, yes. And the reporter said, well, what did you think of it? And he said, well, it was half truth and half lies. But we all know the New York Times is a well-balanced newspaper. Chris Caruso, Director of Politics in Motion. I'm a popular educator, community organizer, and educational technologist. Politics in Motion is a new anti-capitalist media platform founded in May 2023 by David Harvey, Miguel Robles Duran, and myself. We're working to create an intellectual strike force from the left. Our collective aim is to unsettle and combat the ideas of the billionaire class. We are assembling leading thinkers on our podcast to redefine strategies to build socialism in a transdisciplinary, non-sectarian way. We're proud to offer our Patreon supporters exclusive monthly live question and answer sessions with our podcasters. Questions will be submitted in advance as well as live so that our supporters can dialogue directly with our team. Podcasts from Laura Rakovic and from Ecuador, Ana Rodriguez will be launching soon. And we're thrilled to announce that we have new podcasters joining our team. From Brazil, Raquel Rolnick. From the UK, Andy Merrifield. And from the US, Willie Baptist, Sierra Taylor, and John Wessel McCoy. Our aim is to have all our podcasts launched by the end of 2023. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash politics in motion. Thank you. I thought that was a wonderful thing, actually, because I always ask myself the question now when I'm reading the New York Times, am I in the lie section or am I in the truth section? And uh, this has uh, come very, very strongly into focus because, to my surprise, the other day there was a lead article on the first page of the New York Times about uh, the subversion going on uh, in world politics as the China propaganda machine manages to establish all kinds of roots, and those roots are all over the place. And uh, what is more, uh, there is almost uh, impossible to trace it all because it all goes back to a one very wealthy uh, millionaire billionaire almost, 
who is funding all kinds of uh, parts of Chinese propaganda throughout the United States. And one of the institutions which was mentioned in this article of about propaganda and from the left, one of the institutions was something called the People's Forum. Now, I teach at the People's Forum. I've been in the Teachers' Forum for some time, since it was founded. Uh, I've helped the Teachers' Forum. In fact, I gave them my library of books so that they could have a, a lot of things. And the great thing about the Teachers' Forum, the People's Forum, is that there's a, a space in which the left c people can get together and talk and think about it. Now, it's, it's an odd thing to say, but the New York real estate market is such that you cannot find a place to have a meeting uh, without paying through the nose. And, you know, the left people are never very rich. So here comes this very rich person uh, and, uh, uh, and what he does is to say, OK, I can actually fund uh, the creation of a, a space uh, for left activities in, in Manhattan. Oh, this is, this is a fantastic, sort of wonderful thing for many of us. And we didn't know, however, that this was all part of the Chinese propaganda machine. And it all actually, frankly, sounds quite ridiculous to us. And I, I feel the same way about it that Owen Latimer felt about all the charges that were made against him. I just didn't make uh, any, any sense. But when you actually look uh, more closely, you, see, you find something else. Because what the New York Times is con concerned about, I suspect, and I'm going to hypothesize here, I'm going to make a guess, I suspect that the United States has been so heavily invested in the exposure of the lies of the Trump organization and the lies of uh, much of the far right and, and so on, and, and it, it is trying to show that it is even-handed. And in fact, at one point in this article, uh, what you find is uh, a, a sort of a statement which kind of said, well, we've seen enough of all of the lies and propaganda of the right wing, and now we want to see how the left wing does it. So this is how he does it. Now, there were five journalists put on this. And they were operating in India and South Africa and Brazil and the United States and China and everything. And this was not an inexpensive operation. It was very expensive. And I'd be very interested to know if there was any outside funding, because this is the sort of thing that outside funding of the right uh, loves to do, which is to kind of uh, create mayhem, if it can, uh, amongst the forces on the left. And in this instance, of course, what was happening was the New York Times was credentializing itself by saying, well, we also go after the far left, too. We are also against Antifa, the anti-fascists. And in fact, the Antifa people are very dangerous because uh, they're very well organized, because they are part of the China propaganda machine. Now, here's something interesting. The word propaganda gets used again and again and again. In other circumstances, you would say that the Chinese government was interested in spreading information as to what was happening in China in an accurate and orderly way. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at it, uh, almost every U.S. embassy uh, and consulate and, and, and cultural center and all the rest of it does exactly uh, what uh, this left phantom left organization is supposed to do. That is, uh, they, they, they try to put the best face on U.S. politics, uh, how, and they try to create an image of the United States which is benevolent and positive. Uh, this is, well, the Chinese, of course, are doing the same. But when the Chinese do it, it's called propaganda. Uh, and when uh, the U.S. does it, it's just informing people for how what a wonderful group of people we are. And we, we, we do this very seriously. Of course, uh, in doing it, we do not mention some of the failings uh, of the, that we have. Uh, I'm sure that, for example, in, in a couple of weeks, we will be uh, uh, listening a lot to the, the way in which 9-11 uh, and the events of 9-11 are being commemorated. And uh, that awful event uh, was, was indeed uh, tragic, 
and and terrible and and uh, it's quite reasonable for um, you know U.S. institutions uh, to to commemorate it. The only thing that I would want to say is that it might be a good idea for the United States also to commemorate on next 9/11 the fact that that is the 50th anniversary of Pinochet's coup against Salvador Allende in Chile. Now, that coup was not organized by the United States in detail. Uh, the coup was uh, largely due to the Opus Dei characters and the landed interest and all the rest of it. But the US provided all of the mechanical and communicative equipment which allowed the coup to take place as smoothly as it did. And of course, a lot of people died. Uh, Alfred Jar, the musician, was killed. Uh, and and, and, and uh, maybe this September the 11th, besides commemorating what had happened, what happened uh, to uh, uh, people on the events of, uh, of, that, of that awful day, uh, maybe add it to it and kind of express apologies for the way in which the United States actually uh, aided and abetted Pinochet's coup against a uh, democratically elected government. And while it's at it, it might do the same thing for uh, its support to the military uh, takeover in Brazil in the 1960s, to the generals uh, coming to power in Argentina and so on, uh, to the overthrow of the Arbenz regime in, in, in Guatemala. Now, obviously, no... Uh, uh, consulate or embassy is going to dwell on all of these negative things. It's going to put the nice things or things like 9-11 uh, 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 memorial uh, to somehow or other persuade the world that the United States is a decent place and, and, and all the rest of it. Well, of course, the Chinese are going to do the same. No, the Chinese uh, do it. The French do it. I occasionally go to meetings of the Alliance Francaise. Uh, well, uh, they're trying to... Uh, emphasize how nice a place France is. The German embassy has, has some very interesting uh, things going on. So, you know, every, every country uh, spends some time uh, trying to persuade every, the world what a nice, good place it is and what good things they're, they're doing. Um, but this, of course, is then taken to be propaganda. Now, whenever you use the word propaganda, you presume two things. One is there is this association of propaganda with Nazi Germany and that therefore there is something very, very objectionable about the nature of the information. And the second thing is that this, this propaganda is based on a lie. And, and of course, uh, we have therefore to think about, uh, uh, well, who does the lie and what the lies, lies are about. And, and this is terribly, uh, again, something that is significant, something that's uh, in, in, important to do. Um, but, uh, of course, we know very, very well that the United States government lies. I mean, the Pentagon Papers was all about lies. Uh, the Iraq War was based upon a lie. So it's not as if uh, somehow or other the Chinese have a monopoly of lying. I'm sure the, the Chinese uh, do some uh, things in terms of reasons of state. They cover over certain things and don't talk about other things. But then all the countries of the world do this. So, so what is it that makes this particular kind of uh, situation uh, one which should be considered worthy of congressional investigation? Because after this article came out about the nefarious activities uh, of uh, uh, this wealthy businessman, Roy Singham, uh, and his wife, uh, Jody Evans, uh, after that came out uh, immediately, uh, Marco Rubio sends a letter to the Justice Department and said all of these investigations, all of these places should be, all, all of these people and all of these institutions should be investigated uh, by the Justice Department uh, because they should register themselves as representative, re active representatives of a, of a foreign power. Well, I teach in the People's Forum, which is one of the institutions which they want to go after. Uh, I, I, I teach there because uh, well, this is where like-minded people can be. I also teach there because it's a good thing that I not teach 
keep my teaching so that it is on the campus as well as on in the in the community. There is something very special about the City University of New York that, in principle, is very much about bringing education to the whole city, not just to the students. In, the, in it. so, as part of that mission, uh, I, I I I work with it. I I go to events there. Uh, I, I I'm very I'm very happy there. I cannot remember ever anybody ever suggesting to me that I should take this or that line. And here is again the, the, the trick, and this is what happened when I was talking about Owen Lattimore uh, last, last time. Here is the trick. Uh, you don't uh, say somebody is a communist or a communist sympathizer directly. You find out uh, in what degrees are they actually uh, following a, 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 a critical line of, a left, of the left parties, of Communist Party, for example. And this is, uh, so it's again this guilt by association, that if I say, look, capital is producing a lot of poverty throughout the world, uh, China has actually rescued people, around 740 million people from poverty over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, whereas this country has plunged more and more people into poverty. So that maybe capitalism is not such a good system as people maintain. It's very good for some people because, okay, Elon Musk is now uh, hugely rich. Jeff Bezos is hugely rich. Uh, the number of uh, billionaires in the United States has uh, doubled in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, the wealth of the, of the, uh, of the very richest part of the top 1% has doubled uh, in recent times. And if I say all of those things are rather bad and we should do something about it, and by the way, China has actually uh, started to emphasize the wish for some sort of common prosperity, I'm like to just say, well, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think that uh, I'm glad that China is working for, towards common prosperity. Wouldn't it be nice in this country if we did so? Uh, and common prosperity was defined by the, the President Xi as uh, equ equitable access uh, to health care, equitable access to education, and equitable access to housing. Now, if we had a government in this country that was actually given over to those, uh, those three things, I would be very, very delighted and very happy about it. And I think actually quite a lot of people would benefit from it. So it's possible to look at what is going on in China and say, well, you know, there's something there that is going on which is worth emulating. Uh, and uh, those are the sorts of things that I w would, would on occasion talk about. I don't think that makes me an apologist for the, the, the Chinese regime. It just is me saying, well, some governments do some good things in some places, and when they do good things, we should take note because we might be able to do the same good things here. For example, when I was in uh, teaching in Nanjing, I met with the uh, governor of, or, or director or whatever it is of uh, Jiangsu province. And uh, we had a conversation and she was very interested in the questions of uneven geographical development. And I had some conversations with her about it. And I said, you know, one of the difficulties in the world is uh, the, the increasing impoverishment of rural life. Uh, the fact that uh, rural communities uh, have lost their economic base and in many parts of the world have, they've ended up in, in kind of situations of opioid addiction and, and all the rest of it, like in you know, rural Pennsylvania or rural Ohio and so on. So this is a real problem. And she said, oh, yeah, oh, look, this is a, we, we, we've been thinking about that problem here and we've done some things about it. And, I, and she talked a little bit about some of the things they had done. And about five days later, I get an admission. She wants to take you out to the countryside and show you one of the things, some of the things they've done, which, of course, I did. Now, I was going to a show thing. Of course, it was a show thing. Not everywhere is like this. But on the other hand, this show place was very interesting because what they had done was they took five rather derelict villages and they'd linked them together by bike paths. And they'd, uh, you know, and so you could actually cycle from one village to the other, and there was a tea house in each village, and some things to buy in each village, and it was 30 kilometers outside of, uh, outside of the center of Nanjing, and uh, people could ride out from Nanjing, and they could rent bicycles and go around. 
And I, and I went round to it a little bit, and there were some wonderful, wonderful fields of lavender. And I said, well, oh, that's great. You know, I, I guess you must be making that for, uh, uh, for perfumes or something. Oh, no, 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 we just cultivate the lavender fields so that people, when they come out here, can cycle through the lavender fields. And I thought, well, this is rather nice. I think this is a rather good idea. Why don't we do this in, you know, I don't know, some rural area in the United States? Uh, now, does that make me uh, an agent of, uh, of Chinese propaganda? Uh, was I uh, receiving uh, propaganda? Maybe I was. I couldn't verify the fact that she said to me that they doubled the rural incomes from all of this in the last 10 years, and she was very proud of that. Uh, but it certainly seemed to me that uh, uh, you know, the family structure was in place. Uh, and I sort of asked about that, and she said, well, you know, there's less migration into the city. Young people still go to the city because it's an exciting place to be. The people who stay here are more likely to be the, uh, the older people with families and, 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 and that. And that. So here is a picture emerging in my mind of, of, of certain things which I would say about China, which are not hostile to what the Chinese have done and are very positive. Now, there are some things where I'm sure that as I find out more about them that I won't want to be critical of, and I'm very happy to do so. But this idea, which we're getting right now, that China is the arch enemy and everything that China touches turns to sort of dirty, glutinous kind of mess. Uh, this, this, this has just gone on, and both parties are, are, are playing at it. Both parties are playing at the anti-China, uh, the anti-China card, and they're trying to turn the, the China into the big boogeyman. I think that is wrong, but I'm not a member of any kind of a, a Chinese conspiracy. I'm very grateful to, to Roy Singham, very grateful indeed, for the fact that he allowed us, uh, who have, want to talk about all of these things, a place where we can get together and communicate and discuss. We can't even get a, a space to do things in our own university, it turns out, because on weekends, if we want to get a, have a conference on a weekend, uh, we, we have to actually <coughs> we actually have to um, you know, pay for all of the, the doormen and uh, assistants and the cleaning and all the rest of it. It becomes much too uh, expensive. So in fact, we end up going with our conferences going to the People's Forum. The People's Forum is a wonderful institution. I don't see it as anything other than educational. Yes, it talks not in an anti-Chinese way. It's willing to talk about China positively, willing to criticize it, and, and that is all you can really, really ask. But here's this article in the New York Times. And what is terrible about it is it gets picked up and it used round of the country as if it is God's own truth. And the, United, and, and, the, and the New York Times has actually burgeoned its credentials, if you like, as being a paper which is well-balanced newspaper. It's, it, it, it goes after the left and it goes after the right. Well, they are not the same as each other. The left and the right in this country are not the same as each other, not at all. And uh, that is something which uh, we need to uh, recognize. And, and uh, then, of course, uh, the, the, there might well be hearings and we'll get the kind of Lattimore thing where somebody like me will get stuck there and for five and a half years I'll be having to talk about whether or not uh, I talk to any communists. Well, there are 92 million communists in, 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 in China. It's very difficult to imagine being there for very long without actually talking to some of them. So uh, well, did I know there were communists? I supposed that some were and that some were not. Um, but in a sense, it didn't really matter to me because I was interested in finding out what's really going on on the ground. And there was a time, and this is why, what I want to finish with, there was a time when I was uh, writing, for example, a uh, brief history of neoliberalism, where I really wanted to get some information on the question of, is China going neoliberal? Is it going to the market economy? Is it going that way? And, and I needed the, 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 the information from good reporters to tell me what was going on on the ground. And at that time, the New York Times had a group of reporters working in, in throughout uh, China, which was, uh, was extremely useful to me in writing that book. I could not have written a book without the kind of reporting 
uh, that they were giving me of what was going on the ground. We can interpret it differently, if you like, but it was a, a, very, a very important thing to me, and that was back in 2004, 2005. It is now a point where I cannot trust a single word of any New York Times reporter in China. Uh, I clearly am objecting very, very early to this article which came out, which pretended that we were all part of some uh, conspiracy, that we were all part of some propaganda machine, uh, and actually, I think that this was a this was a hack, ha hatchet job, uh, trying to cut down an institution which is uh, and a set of institutions which are actually contributing mightily in many different ways to the actual improvement of people's daily lives. And this is the tragedy of the situation, that by the New York Times trying to position itself in the center, that it actually leads to uh, a fierce attack upon people who are really trying to do something uh, a little bit left of center, and more towards uh, the actual achievement of some kind of socialist justice, as opposed to the market justice which currently reigns in the United States.